In last week's video, we discussed how to meet the requirement to design an N plus one building management system or control system for a data center. In today's video, I wanted to just expand a bit more on that and run through the process that I do or the steps as I design a, or I create a specification for a building management system for a data center. Now, for those of you that are BMS engineers, uh, your design will obviously be more detailed than this, but um, you could sort of pick up a few things around how I run through my process and get a few ideas of things to keep an eye out for. When I'm looking to start doing the BMS design or the BMS specification for a data center, the first thing I like to do is just pretty much get set up. So I look at my calendar and over the four to six weeks time frame, I'll just book a, block a day out every week to do this as I work on these different phases. And this first phase, what I like to do is to just dump as much information as possible into the, the points list, for example, as quickly as I can. I don't like to get too involved in any of the details around the reliability or the redundancy or the resilience of the BMS. So what I'd normally do is, um, the first thing I'd do is I would just skim through and read the client's brief. Um, and usually the BMS component of a client's brief is quite a small section really. So you'd read it like in 10 minutes. It's not like mechanical and electrical and structural. It could be like quite big pieces of, you know, big sections in the brief. And it's really important because Sometimes something will be mentioned in the brief um, that's required and it's not in the specification if you're a contractor. So get a hold of the brief and usually a specification would somewhere in there would actually reference the client's brief so that the consultant cover themselves that the contractor should be compliant to the client's brief. So if it says it in there, request a copy of it and go through it. Then as a consultant, I like to then go and talk to each of the other consultants, so the mechanical, electrical, and fire, for example. So I'll go sit down with the mechanical engineer because they wouldn't have produced their design yet either because they're also in this sort of startup phase. But I'd go and sit down and say, look, what do we have? You know, they say, look, we have, you know, th we're going to have three air-cooled chillers, there's, there's no cooling towers, and we're going to have some crack units and a mechanical board, and we're going to have these air handling units, um, we're going to have fan coordinates in the battery room and the UPS room, and just get an idea, and I'll just write some notes of what they got. Then I go off to the electrical consultant and I'll ask them, you know, how many generators do we have? How many UPS do we have? Where are they? Um, you know, just get a feeling for what their scope is. And then lastly, go to the fire engineer. You know, do we have like gas suppression in the hall? And do I need to monitor that? And where, where might it be? So although they don't have all the answers, I'm just getting a feeling for what they're going to do so I can start gearing up. And the same applies if you're a contractor. Go and talk to the other contractors, mechanical, electrical, fire. Uh, introduce yourself to them, get their contact details, start talking about, let them know what you need so that when they've got it ready, they can give it to you. And then just say, look, I'll check in with you in two or three weeks or a month and we'll, we'll see how you're going. Um, and what I do then is I get my point schedule and I just, for three or four hours, I just dump everything into the point schedule. I don't worry about N plus one or nothing. I just copy and paste from other specifications, all the points lists in there that I need for those sections. And you'd do that too. You'd create your point schedule just from other point schedules and you copy and paste all the stuff in there. So in that phase one, I'm not getting bogged down on details. I'm just dumping everything in as much as I can, get as much as I can done in a small amount of time. And I'll stop there and I go off and I do something else for the rest of the week. Uh, work on other jobs, do other things. Because what I like to do is I often find that I'll be, you know, a day or two later, I'll be doing something. I'll think, oh, hey, hang on a sec, that's not going to work. Or I get an idea and I, and I write it down. So I don't like to generally say, look, I'm going to start on Monday and finish on Thursday. I'm going to do this whole design. I don't like to do that because I just don't have time to sort of get my head around it um, and prepare. Now, in phase two, what I then do is, so it's, it's a week later, I sit down, turn my phone off, turn the email off, and I, I'm going to block out, you know, two to four hours. And I just focus on the N plus one requirement that we spoke about last week. So all I do is I get my points list and I just start breaking it out into other more tabs or whatever it is. And I think about that there's the three chillers and I've got one controller, two controllers, three controllers in three different boxes. 
Um, I've got two fan coordinates in the battery room. And I think all these things through and I, I just start breaking it up. It's all I'm doing. And I'll print out, you know, the plant room layout drawings and I'll um, position on there these, you know, the, the three control panels on that wall. Start thinking about where things are going to sit and how they're going to connect together. And, you know, because the network will flow on from this, this sort of positioning of panels. There's nothing worse when you're focusing on the points list and the months go by and you walk into that room and you realize it's a lot smaller than you thought it was and you haven't coordinated a, a, you know, a two meter spot on the wall where you can put your panels on, it hasn't happened. So, and then you just, you know, it becomes, you look pretty in, unprofessional. So quite early in the job, I'm sort of thinking about where things will be. And when I next talk to electrical, I might say, look, where are your distribution boards going? Or um, just sort of get an idea of where things are. So that's phase two, it's pretty simple. I just don't do anything else. That's just my focus, I do that. Now in phase three, this is when we start to think about the redundancy part of it. So in phase three, again, it's a few weeks later in my calendar, there's a four to eight hour or two hour block of time to work on this. Now I take my points list and I start to run through and sort of think about my single points of failure. So for example, if on this controller, I have one uh, chilled water bypass valve, which is modulating to maintain the minimum flow to the chillers, and fully opens on chiller stage up so that the running chiller isn't stopped with water. We've spoken about that in, in detail a few months ago. I look at that, that's a single point of failure, so I need to have two of those. So I have a duty and standby chill water bypass valve on different controllers, so I'll do that. And um, the system pressure transmitter, if I have you know, these three pumps are modulating to maintain the system pressure at the design set point, there's only one of them, I need more of them. So the first thought process is like, okay, look, I probably need to have two of them, a duty and a standby one. You could average them out or the max or min or whatever it is, you can do something like that. But what I've been noticing on the last few tier three and tier four data centers, and we might actually talk about that in a second, but uh, this job I did before, we had you know, the, the two chill water circuits. So we had you know, chill water circuit A and chill water circuit B. And that job, we had a chill water circuit underneath the floor and we had a chiller circuit in the ceiling. And it was quite cool because we had the crack units and they were piped from the top circuit and the bottom circuit with isolation valves. So you could either feed the cracks off the top circuit or feed the cracks off the bottom circuit. So I had one pressure transmitter on circuit A and one pressure transmitter on circuit B. And then I realized, hang on a sec, if they shut down circuit A for three months to do pipework modifications or refurbishments or expansions to the data center, we'd be running on one circuit for a few months and then I'd only have one pressure transmitter and that'd be a single point of failure. So then I put two pressure transmitters on circuit one and, or circuit A and two pressure transmitters on circuit B. So in my mind, usually on a data center, the back of my mind, I usually you know, plan for four pressure transmitters. Um, I could rationalize that down, but it's definitely not one. It's probably not gonna be two. It's more likely to be four pressure transmitters. So I'm going through this process thinking about where's my instrumentation and what are my points of failure and where do I need two of them? But the main thing here is that you've got to remember to set aside a time that you focus specifically on this component, the reliability and the redundancy and single points of failure. If you're doing a big block of design and doing lots of things and it's a lot of stuff to sort of be across, you will forget these things. You'll forget very basic things, but if you set a reminder in your diary that on Tuesday for two hours I'm just thinking about single points of failure. You will think of lots of things, you'll be surprised and you'll save yourself a little pain later on when you realize that you are not going to meet the requirements of a tier three or tier four, tier four data center. If you have air handling units with economy dampers, outside air, return air and exhaust air, put a zero to ten volt positive feedback off the actuator. We really we should be doing that. So, and the thing is that what happens here is it, it gets expensive because what we tend to do is we're doubling all these points and we're just costing them as as double costed points. So what I'd suggest is go and talk to your installer and say to them, listen here, we've got these three actuators and we want to get a positive feedback. You've already allowed for a single cable to each one. It's a three core cable. It's now a four core cable. Like an, the extra fourth core costs like somewhere between nothing 
and just a few cents per meter. Not, not nothing, of course, but you know what I mean. And when the electrician has got the actuator off and he's fitting off the 3K with his screwdriver to put a fourth cable in there, it's not going to take very long. And when you buy the actuator and you order that accessory for the feedback, like it's going to cost $50 extra or something. Yes, you need the extra input in the controller. That's another story. But, but generally, these we shouldn't be charging like $500 per point for the feedback. And I think that's why these costs blow out when we start to do positive feedback. But really, if we just think it through carefully and talk to our, our installers and you know, those sort of things, we can get feedback in quite cheaply, really. It's, it should be. So um, you could put positive feedback on the valve actuators. I sometimes just tend to use the supply temperature sensor. It'll tell you if it's cold or not cold you know, off the coil. But just run through that process. What do I need more of? Duty standby type of stuff. Now we're starting to run out of time, so what I'll do is I'm going to cut this off today and then uh, next week we'll continue on with the next two phases and it's actually looking like it's going to take three weeks to actually get all the way through to the seventh phase. So keep an eye out for that next week and I'll see you then.